I'm Christian Bryant. Consider me your news sommelier, and I'm gonna lay out our tasting menu for what's ahead. Facebook is likely getting a new name, or at least the company is, not the website. But will that change come with meaningful changes to how the company operates? Plus, later in the show, we're looking at how businesses are adapting to our changing climate. But first, our top story. The disappearance and death of Gabby Petito has put a new spotlight on the issue of people going missing. Over half a million people went missing in the US last year alone, according to FBI data. But oftentimes, those going missing are people of color whose disappearances just don't get as much attention. In many states, a disproportionate number of those missing or killed are indigenous people. The Justice Department says that Native American women are murdered at a rate that's more than 10 times the national average. It's a real crisis, and we're starting to see more being done about it. The US Department of the Interior, now run by the first indigenous cabinet secretary, Deb Holland, has launched a new missing and murder unit to investigate cases of missing and murdered people. Several states have also taken steps forward in addressing the issue, including Minnesota, where national correspondent Jesse Cohen breaks down a new state office that has been set up to handle cases of missing and murdered indigenous persons. Janice Hannigan, Roma L. Jim, Mary Johnson, do you know their names? They are just a few of the indigenous people missing in our country. Why hasn't Sheila St. Clair from Duluth who's been missing for six years, how come her story isn't out there? Why don't we know her name? How come we don't know about Jojo Boswell who's been missing for decades? and who was 19. It's an ongoing issue in the United States. Advocates say a lack of communication combined with jurisdictional issues among state, local, federal, and tribal law enforcement make it difficult to start the investigative process. Our relationship with our federal government is much different than other racial or ethnic groups in the United States, right? This is our land. We are all standing, everybody is that is in this country is standing on Indian land. Nicole Matthews, the executive director of the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, experiences the frustration firsthand. If a non-native person comes onto our land and rapes a native woman, our tribes have no recourse. So if the state or the feds who do have jurisdiction in those cases decline prosecution, that person walks. It's why she was the vice chair of the Missing and Murdered Women's Task Force in Minnesota. And that has led to the country's first state office for missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Oh my gosh, I just got goosebumps listening to you say that. It is, um, I'm still floored that we were able to do this good legislation. Senator Mary Kunish spearheaded this effort in the Minnesota Senate. They were able to use fundings through the governor's um, office to, to initially create this, but it'll also be supported through public safety dollars. The office now has permanent funding, which means it's not going anywhere. One of their main efforts is building a database that will track those names and cases. Now we need to have that liaison there that's going to be able to go walk between and work between all these different agencies. No database has made gathering information tough. However, the task force was able to pinpoint some jarring statistics. In our task force work, we learned that um, in a 10 year period, in any given month, there were anywhere from 27 to 54 native women that were missing. Native women represent about 1% of the population here in Minnesota, but we represent eight or 9% of the murdered women in Minnesota. Marissa Cummings, the CEO of the Minnesota Women's Resource Center, says there is distrust in government from some tribal members, especially women. The lack of trust that our people have with systems in this country, systems that have been designed um, to exterminate us. Now there is an opportunity to create trust through this office and its partnerships. I think the office can be a starting point if the office is, is staffed with Native women that the community trusts. So a lot of times our families, when they go to report someone missing, they're not believed. A lot of times um, a woman reporting a sexual assault isn't believed or deaths are considered um, exposure. These women say Gabby Petito's case is not only a reminder of why this office is so crucial in Minnesota, but also how it can be adopted in every other state. The response that Gabby Petito received is the response that all of us deserve. But I think that we're entering a time now where we're demanding that there is some accountability, 
and some equity in the way that this, these systems work in our country. Minnesota has obviously made this a priority and recognizes that it's an investment in our, in our communities now, but it's also, like we say in the Native com uh, communities, investment in the next seven generations to come. In Minneapolis, I'm Jesse Cohen reporting. Minnesota isn't the only state taking matters into their own hands. In Oklahoma, Democratic Representative Mickey Dollins offered bipartisan legislation known as Ida's Law, which directs the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to work with the federal government, tribal governments, and local law enforcement to get funding for its own unit addressing missing and murdered indigenous persons. Oklahoma is home to 39 federally recognized tribal nations. It also reportedly has one of the highest rates of missing or murdered indigenous women, though full data can be hard to come by. Passing laws to dedicate more resources to address the number of missing and murdered indigenous persons is just one part of the solution. Some grassroots groups on the ground want to see more done to make sure that there's broader recognition and awareness of the scope of the problem. Newsy's Allison Herrera is a national correspondent out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. She talked to one of those grassroots groups, as well as those working in law enforcement about this issue. And she spent years covering indigenous affairs and the challenges facing indigenous communities. She's here to talk with us more in depth about her reporting. Allison, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us on In The Loop. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Ida's law? I mean, what does it do? And who was this law named after? Well, thanks for having me on. So Ida's Law in, is named after a young Cheyenne and Arapaho woman named Ida Beard, who went missing in 2015. And so uh, at, at that time, uh, Representative Mickey Dolans, who is a Democrat in the um, Oklahoma legislature, he's told me he wasn't really aware of the crisis involving missing and murdered Indigenous people until a woman named Lorenda Morgan, who was Ida Beard's aunt, came to him and explained, you know, my, my, my niece has been missing. Um, I, I really, there has been little, uh, little outcry, um, not a lot of attention paid, paid to Ida's case. And so um, Mickey Dolan's um, committed himself to writing this law called Ida's, uh, Ida's Law in 2019, got passed in April of 2021, earlier this year. And so what it does is it directs tribal, state, and federal authorities to coordinate when a young indis, um, Indigenous woman or Indigenous man or girl or boy goes missing, because oftentimes families um, they'll go to the district attorney, say, and the district attorney in that county would be like, well, we don't have jurisdiction on this case anymore. It's in, there's always been jurisdictional challenges when it comes to felony crimes in Indian country. And so Ida's law is meant to combat that. You've mentioned data collection. You've mentioned jurisdictional issues. Um, we understand that Ida's law is meant to address a lot of these issues, but... <laughs> What are some other barriers and problems um, to missing and murdered indigenous folks that, you know, maybe legislation can't fix? Um, that's a good question. And I will say on the point of data, police departments don't often, um, they'll, their data collection is kind of faulty. They don't, they will um, use the incorrect race for people, you know, in, in, incorrect ethnicity. But another thing that really hinders um, that hinders missing indigenous people going found is kind of a, a lack of a thorough investigation. And sometimes um, on the part of law enforcement, uh, an attitude that it was their, it's sort of their fault or it's their lifestyle. One family I talked to said, uh, you know, they had talked to a deputy and that this particular deputy said that they didn't even think that their niece was missing. Uh, he said, well, it's just her life, it's her lifestyle. I think that it's, um, that sometimes there's a lack of a thorough investigation and sometimes it's the attitude of local law enforcement like you know we don't um we don't really believe she's missing or this isn't an issue um and and i think that that's i think to me that's something that a law cannot solve this is national correspondent allison herrera allison thank you so much for being with us again on itl we appreciate it thank you so much for having me Many thanks to Allison for her reporting and her expertise. 
When you're back, we're hitting today's trending topics. See you in just a bit. Welcome back, folks. While we love pausing the news cycle at the top of the show, we like to use this section to get caught up in it. Here's a look at what's trending on social media. Hashtag InSARS and hashtag InSARS Memorial are trending today to mark one year since Nigerian Special Forces beat and killed protesters who were calling for an end to the country's special anti-robbery squad, also known as SARS. But despite Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari's promise of police reforms, not much has changed. Police officers were filmed brutally arresting protesters who were marking the anniversary Wednesday. On October 12th of last year, President Buhari announced he would disband SARS and commit to police reforms following demonstrations across the country. But eight days later, security forces committed the most memorable acts of violence by opening fire on protesters at the Lekki toll gate in Lagos. More than 10 people were killed in what's been called the Lekki Massacre. Actress Ruby Rose flooded her Instagram story Wednesday with alleged details about terrible working conditions on the set of the CW's Batwoman. I need you to fix his suit. The suit is literal perfection. It will be, when it fits a woman. In a series of posts, Rose says she was forced to quickly return to work after having emergency neck surgery. She was told the entire cast and crew would lose their jobs if she didn't hurry back. And she says she wasn't the only one who was hurt. Rose detailed how many crew members and stunt people suffered injuries too. She also accused TV exec Peter Roth of inappropriate behavior with women, including having them steam his pants while he was wearing them, and said Roth hired a private investigator to track her. Rose left that woman in May of 2020 before the second season and didn't give a reason why at the time, which left a lot of people scratching their heads. Javicia Leslie has since stepped in as a new Batwoman on the show. Facebook is looking into a name change and lucky for them, they won't have to go through the Social Security Administration to do so. The change could come as soon as next week. And the reasoning? To better reflect its focus on building the metaverse. Basically, Facebook wants to be known for more than just social media. Mark Zuckerberg plans to explain this more at their annual Connect conference on October 28th. The rebrand is likely to group the Facebook app under a parent company that oversees all of its social platforms, including Instagram, WhatsApp, and others. Google did something similar in 2015 when they reorganized all of their products under a company called Alphabet, with the goal of being seen as more than just a search engine. Facebook has faced a lot of scrutiny in recent years from the government for its business practices, and recently, former employee and data scientist Francis Haugen back these claims in her testimony to Congress. Despite the scandal, Zuckerberg has said focusing on the metaverse will be Facebook's next big chapter. Facebook may be trying to change its identity after a crisis, but sometimes change itself can be a crisis. That's what we're seeing with the still unresolved search for a new host to replace the late Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. It's been almost a year since Trebek died and the show still does not have a permanent host. It's been wild and confusing, so I'll take a good explanation for a thousand, please. Newsy is partnering with the Washington Post's video team for more in-depth reporting and analysis, including this walkthrough of why Jeopardy! has had such a tough time finding a new host. I have some news to share with all of you, and it's in keeping with my longtime policy of being open and transparent with our Jeopardy! fan base. Jeopardy! has been in the spotlight since beloved host Alex Trebek passed away from pancreatic cancer in November of 2020. Not many things in life are perfect, but Alex did this job pretty much perfectly for more than 36 years. The show's journey to find its next permanent host is still ongoing. How can you fill a role held by just one person over nearly four decades? First came a tryout period of guest hosts, which included NFL quarterback Aaron Rodgers, former Reading Rainbow host LeVar Burton, CNN anchor Anderson Cooper, Dr. Oz, former Jeopardy! champion Ken Jennings, neuroscientist and The Big Bang Theory star Mayim Bialik, and Mike Richards, the show's own executive producer. On August 11th, 2021, the show announced Richards would fill Trebek's weekday spot and Bialik would join in for primetime specials. Some criticized the selection, noting Richards' role as EP 
and questioning the influence he might have had behind the scenes. It's Mayim Bialik and the executive producer Weird. of Jeopardy, Mike Richards. <laughs> <laughs> he basically chose himself as the host. A week later, the normally uncontroversial show entered one of the shakiest times in its history. The Ringer published a damning report, resurfacing disparaging comments Richards had made about women, the poor, Jewish people, and more on a podcast he hosted from 2013 to 2014. Richards apologized and stepped aside from his new gig, remaining aboard as executive producer. It is genuinely hard to imagine a five-word phrase less welcome than, we know who you are, aside from, obviously, New Jeopardy host Mike Richards. Looks like Richards' job might be in <laughs> Jeopardy. When public outrage persisted in the weeks that followed, Jeopardy's parent company, Sony, ultimately severed ties with him. But that wasn't the end. Richards had pre-taped five episodes that aired in mid-September. On September 16th, the show announced Mayim Bialik and Ken Jennings would split hosting duties through the end of 2021. The category for Final Jeopardy is Around the World. Bialik takes the stage through November 5th, and then the pair will share the responsibilities. But neither Bialik nor Jennings have a clean slate with the public. Bialik has been criticized for her outlook on several topics, most notably for her wariness about vaccines. In her 2012 parenting book, she said her kids weren't on a typical vaccine schedule. She attempted to clear this up during the coronavirus pandemic. This year, I'm gonna do something I literally haven't done in 30 years. I'm gonna get a vaccine. Jennings' past has come to haunt him too. In some since-deleted tweets, Jennings made fun of people with disabilities and also made comments about former President Donald Trump's youngest son, Barron. Bialik has expressed she would like to become the show's permanent host. Only time will tell what next season holds. Thanks to our friends at the Washington Post for that piece. Coming up, you may have heard about NFTs before, but what do you do if someone tries to make money on an NFT of something you created? We'll have an answer for you after a quick break. Imagine for a second that you are an independent artist. You've been working hard to share your pieces online, get your name out there, and hopefully get some commissions and get some art sold. Now, imagine you see a post of someone showing off a new NFT they just bought. And sure enough, when you look closer, that NFT is of your art. I can't say how I'd react because this is a kid-friendly show, but you think to yourself, hang on. No one paid me for that. How is someone allowed to buy my art without actually buying my art? A very fair question with a pretty complex answer. In this segment from Next Level, Newsy's Matt Pick breaks it down for us and takes us into the wild west of online art auctions and NFT piracy. They're stirring up Hollywood controversies. They're reinventing the sports trading card market. They're resurrecting ancient memes for profit. The blockchain-based collectibles known as NFTs are showing up everywhere right now, especially in the marketplace for digital art. Creators who tie their work to an NFT can sell the token off for a sometimes sizable profit. But as the NFT gold rush grows, so too does the incentive for piracy. More and more artists are finding their work has been made into NFTs without their consent, and there are no clear safeguards to stop it from happening. A fellow artist privately messaged me and said, did you give permission for this website to make your art? And of course not, because I haven't even set up a wallet. You know, I'm not even on the blockchain. Pseudonymous artist Sabi Life works primarily in virtual reality, painting digital 3D sculptures with VR painting programs like Tilt Brush. She told us she's still neutral on whether NFTs will end up being good for the art community or not. Sabi hasn't decided whether to get into NFTs herself, but someone else made the decision for her. A token of her piece, Winter Landscape, went up for sale on VR NFT for around $332, without her knowledge. I was very upset, and I went straight to Twitter about it, you know, and it wasn't just my art, it was other artists that I know, and the entire point of NFTs and the blockchain is to support the actual artists. You know, and this is the only art that we know about because it was caught, right? So how many other pieces out there are being sold that we don't know about. 
An NFT, or non-fungible token, works off of the same blockchain technology that supports cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Instead of minting new cryptocurrency, NFT miners turn their blocks into certificates, embedding a link to a specific piece of media, and then selling those certificates on to buyers who want a collectible tied to that media object. The trouble is, anyone can create an NFT out of anyone else's work. There's almost no oversight on many NFT platforms to ensure an auction is tied to the actual artist. Since NFTs are kind of a new trend, there's a lot of legal uncertainty for artists whose work's been pirated. All the answers to that sort of copyright dispute are, how much money have you got? David Gerard is a journalist and author who's extensively covered blockchain-based technologies. He's uh, somewhat skeptical about how it's currently being used. Cryptocurrency is a multi-layered fractal lasagna of bad ideas. An NFT doesn't actually include any artwork, only a link to it, which makes it hard for artists to assert copyright or ownership over a crypto token that references their art. But the platforms actually auctioning the NFTs do display the artwork tied to the token, which does open those sites up to copyright claims. To their credit, most NFT sites do respect that. So that's good because they're on frankly dodgy legal ground already. So being responsive is probably good. Pirated NFTs are bad enough in their own right, but it can especially sting for artists who've had strong objections to blockchain-based art sales. Crypto economies require ecologically devastating amounts of energy to maintain, and the fragility of the nascent market has convinced a lot of artists that the environmental cost isn't worth the potential gain. In the beginning, like back in fall 2020, when it was like taking off, there was very little discussion about the environmental impacts. And I was just like, hey, like, why are people calling themselves environmental activists when they're minting NFTs? Connor Bell is a digital artist who designs fractal animations. His artwork showed up on the NFT seller OpenSeas, despite his skepticism about the concept. My animation was in a trading card and there was like a link to the page where it was. So they referred to the source, they like credited me, but they were selling an item with my artwork on it. I had been critical of NFTs before that anyway. So I would just like, hey, guess what? My artwork was stolen. Engaging with the NFT market can take a social toll as well as an environmental and financial one. Bell told Newsy he's faced waves of harassment from his public objections to NFTs. And Savvy says she's noticed rifts forming in digital art spaces around NFTs. It's sad, it's not really spoken, but I see it. You know, maybe they're not liking their posts as much or, you know, actually people will unfriend you if you mention that. I know some people firsthand who are like, this is helping me make rents. This is really good for me right now. And I totally feel for those people, my problems are with like the unstoppable army of like affluent tech bros who just constantly sell NFTs and shut down any criticism. Ultimately, Sabi and Bell were both able to get their work removed from the NFT sites after raising the issue on social media. But there are a plethora of different NFT sellers out there. Trying to police every NFT auction of your work could quickly get exhausting. There are a few NFT projects that are trying to address art theft. The Pastel blockchain is floating an AI-driven image detection algorithm to detect duplicate uploads in the network. And NFT registration service Artery uses independent researchers to verify their tokens line up with the right artists. But those kinds of concepts have yet to be implemented on a broader scale. Until they are, the NFT market seems like it'll continue to be a haven for piracy and a contentious subject for the art community. Coming up next, we're moving from how NFTs can impact business to how climate change itself is changing the way we do business. Stick around. Welcome back to In The Loop. If you're a regular, you know who I am. If you're new here, I'm Christian. Nice to meet you. Here at ITL, we seldom pass up an opportunity to talk about climate change. It's just one of those issues that has a wide range of impacts. One of many growing issues is the sea level rise and the rate at which it's rising. In many spots along the US coastline, high tide flooding is now 300 to 900% more frequent than it was 50 years ago. But this isn't just impacting America, it's a global problem. 
According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, by the year 2100, even if the world follows a low greenhouse gas pathway, the global sea level will likely rise at least 12 inches. We could throw numbers at you all day long, but you know how they say a picture is worth a thousand words? This next piece really drives home that point by giving a look at what rising sea levels would actually do to our cities. Projections from a group of scientists show how much of the land we live on now will eventually be underwater if we stay on our current path. And it's pretty eye-opening. National reporter Amanda Brandeis gives us a closer look. We wanted to really show people a postcard from the future. We can choose door A or we can choose door B and it makes a really big difference what we do. Benjamin Strauss says the path we're on now paints a sobering picture, one they set out to illustrate. We took scientific projections of sea level and essentially ported them into the Google Earth environment. And Strauss it, is the chief scientist at Climate Central, an independent organization made up of leading scientists. They wanted to show what'll happen if the planet warms 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 3 degrees Celsius, the carbon emissions pathway we're on now. These images show projected sea level rise in West Palm Beach under the two different scenarios. By heating the planet a certain amount, we essentially set in motion centuries of unrelenting sea level rise. In Tampa, Florida, these images show the path we're on now versus slowing human-caused global warming. The maps and images that we published, those are not going to happen by 2050. By 2050, we should know which of those futures is coming if you unplug a freezer, you know that the ice inside is going to melt, but it's going to take some time. In some places, scientists had to work with artists to Photoshop sea level rise onto pictures. Working with our maps, we put the water exactly where the scientific projection says it belongs. Managing to meet global climate goals will still have devastating effects on coastal cities. 1.5, frankly, is already a lot, but it's probably the best that we could conceivably do at this point since we're already, you know, around 1.1. This is a San Diego beach resort today and projected sea level rise if the planet warms 1.5 degrees. There's a lot of sea level rise already in the pipeline. If we stopped polluting tomorrow, uh, we would see between five and 10 feet of sea level rise probably. As world leaders prepare for the UN climate conference, he asked which legacy they want to leave. The future will remember them only for their failure to control climate change, unless they can. I'm Amanda Brandeis reporting. That's a big picture look at what the future could look like because of climate change. But on a smaller scale, it's already impacting a wide range of businesses. A Deloitte report found nearly three in 10 organizations are noticing the operational impacts of climate-related disasters, from disruptions in supply chains to rising insurance costs and labor challenges. National reporter Chris Conti gives us a firsthand look at how those struggles then trickle down to smaller businesses and how, in this case, the impacts could make some breakfast favorites a lot less sweet. It is hard to convey the beauty of a New England fall, canopies of color seemingly stretched out forever. But these postcard-worthy pictures are glossing over the harsh reality of change. <laughs> this section of the forest is fairly young. Tim Goudreau owns a small farm in southern New Hampshire. The landscape here is his livelihood. Oh, there's my my tap hole from last spring. Every spring, the maple trees around his property provide hundreds of gallons of sap, which Tim then turns into pure maple syrup. But a changing climate is changing all of that. The long term uh, trends are showing that, you know, things are shifting. We went from too cold to too warm. Warmer winters have meant these trees are now producing less sap than they once did. It also means the sugar content of the sap Tim gets is lower. It has significant economic impacts. I'm witnessing it from, you know, my little farm in terms of, you know, I'm experiencing more losses. In the United States, the maple syrup industry generates $686 million each year. But researchers have found maple trees are slowly migrating north to Canada in search of cooler temperatures, putting the entire industry in jeopardy. The human impact on the environment 
is happening to such a rapid degree that we're causing the di mass die-offs of species or the dislocation of species in just short periods of time. By the end of this century, the economic impacts of climate change could be astronomical. By some estimates, businesses in this country could be losing more than $2 trillion a year because our planet is warming so much. There's certain certain regions of the world that are far more vulnerable um, to, to climate change. Jared Woolicott studies how climate change is impacting economies across the globe. As the economic outlook starts to look less colorful, he believes more people will shift their attitudes about climate change. Putting dollars and cents on, on uh, items um, uh, damages um, definitely helps uh, make them more real for uh, for people. Sectors of the economy expected to be hit hardest by climate change, the insurance industry, energy, the beverage industry, commercial fishing, skiing, and wineries. We're not going to have that kind of industry here in the future because it's going to be too warm for the sugar maples to survive. Tim Goudreau has a front row seat to all of it. It's not just the maple syrup business that isn't as sweet as it once was. The unreliability of typical rainfall patterns. This farmer has also lost up to 75% of the Christmas trees he's been planting each year. And I always thought, well, you know, that's a future thing that I've got to figure out. From droughts to unpredictable flash flooding, severe swings in the weather are becoming too much for these trees to handle. What we're seeing is, well, actually, that, that the impacts of climate change are manifesting before our eyes. The beauty here may be profound, but for farmers across this industry, a changing of the seasons isn't the only change they're worried about. In Bardstead, New Hampshire, I'm Chris Conti. The northern and southern borders of the U.S. are reopening to visitors next month, but the situation varies vastly. We head down south after the break to take a look at some of the challenges there. The U.S. will be reopening our borders to fully vaccinated travelers, which is particularly huge news for border towns who say they've been hit hard by the border closures. Newsy's national reporter Thomas Hoppaw tells us more about what this means for those up close at the border. We are reaching with two countries, three states. The closure to non-essential travel was devastating to businesses uh, along the border here in our region. This is El Paso, Texas. It shares a border with Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and it's one of the border towns that was hit hard by the pandemic. We know that just in downtown El Paso, there were something like 45 uh, retail establishments that closed during the, the COVID crisis. So it had a very, very bad uh, and debilitating impact on small businesses. From the state of Texas, they estimate that the impact on the economy in the U.S. is about $2.5 billion um, from, from crossings from Juarez to El Paso in the region. Land borders will reopen to all vaccinated travelers starting November 8th, both the northern border with Canada and here in the south. It is very important because it will uh, resume normal border activity in a place like this. It will have a very positive impact in terms of uh, economic activity, uh, but also in terms of how the families on both sides of the border relate to each other. While both northern and southern border towns share the same problem of wanting things open, here in the south, there are some differences that have made things hard. What are the differences between, you know, what's going on in Mexico and what's going on in Canada, and how is that affecting your border town? Well, we know that there's differences in the vaccination rate. The way that they roll out the vaccination in the south part of the border was different than the way that we rolled out the vaccination process here in the U.S. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, in El Paso in 2020, there were 3 million pedestrian crossings, a 60% drop from the year before. John Barella with the El Paso Borderplex Alliance says the economy is dependent on the relationship between the two cities and people being able to cross over to do business. It's been estimated that between 15 and 30 percent of the retail trade that's transacted on the U.S. side of the border comes from Mexican nationals. But we will see increased trade in the retail and service sector. That's inevitable. Uh, we will see that. 
The big question is, will we be prepared for it? We need the technology, the infrastructure, and the personnel, most importantly, to accommodate that increased travel to and from uh, both countries. We expect to see a surge right away. And in order to keep the borders open, international bridge and economic development is increasing operations and even including pop-up vaccine clinics for those crossing over. We do intend to resume our P3 program with CVP, so that means adding an additional 1,000 hours of overtime um, at, the, at, the, at the ports of entry to reduce wait times, to open more lanes and help with the throughput. Dr. Hector Ocaranza with the El Paso Health Department says health care between the two cities was impacted as well and the reopening will resume health procedures across borders. There's health care that is also cheaper on the other side of the border. Medications are a fraction of the cost of the medications here on this side. Many people used to go across the border to get the medication. Having those chronic conditions Poorly control makes them a high risk of developing complications from COVID or any other uh, disease. So that will put a, a higher strain on our already limited healthcare resources. According to the Mexico consulate in El Paso, in order to keep the borders open, it is crucial that both cities work together to keep vaccination rates high. Juarez has a the percentage vaccination rate of over 80 percent, which is sort of like the same that, ha that El Paso has. So it's important to have the same level, it's the same community. It's important to have the, le the same level of protection so that we can continue, uh, you know, uh, relating with each other. I'm Thomas Hopper reporting. Spend enough time online and you'll see many questionable social media posts about COVID, miracle cures, vaccine misinformation, and lots of convenient anecdotes that seemingly prove all of the experts wrong. That kind of misinformation is exhausting and dangerous, especially when it's reposted by friends and family so it feels like a trusted source. And ultimately, we're seeing a number of prominent anti-vax voices eventually catching COVID and then changing their minds, sometimes too late. National reporter Chris Stewart spoke to someone who admits they pushed misinformation onto people's timelines and is now working to try and undo the damage. While it can be hard to know what to believe these days, Heather Simpson recognizes she was part of the problem. Oh my gosh. It's like, it's so hurtful. The stuff I said was bad. She was an anti-vaccine social media influencer. She admits she spread misinformation, mostly about the tetanus and measles vaccines to countless people online. She showed us this picture of her 2019 Halloween costume. She dressed up like the measles. I posted it thinking my friends would just think it's funny and they did, you know. It, I think it got like, I think it got shared like 300 times. Here we go. She says she became vaccine hesitant two and a half years ago when a friend's mom said she shouldn't get a flu shot. And she called me in a panic and she was like, oh my God, I've seen somebody uh, that got the flu shot and they started walking backwards after that. So just please don't go, get it. <laughs> please don't go get it. And I got it and nothing happened, but it was like the seed was planted with this ridiculous seed. That seed grew into being against vaccines. I got up the nerve to write this big post, kind of like a coming out as an anti-vaxxer post, but not so extreme as I became. And it just, it just talked about my fears about vaccines, my concerns. Her first post got hundreds of shares. It just validated my position. I was like, oh my God, like people relate to this. There's so many people that are also anti-vax. This is a whole community. I'm going to keep posting. And I, I kept posting and I just, everything I posted got shared a ton. Heather says the more aggressive her posts were, the more they spread. And the negative comments she received didn't stop her. And I just took that as, oh, I have hate, so I'm doing something right. People, of course, will will trust, you know, family members more so than they might trust somebody else. And so when you're part of these these kind of group conversations, you will believe the kind of content that's coming from from friends and family. Rory Smith is with First Draft News. The nonpartisan nonprofit group studies how misinformation spreads online. He says while social media companies have promised to do more to stop misinformation, you can only take that at face value. We have no way of systematically seeing whether they have actually done anything to, to mitigate the flow of misinformation, right? Because they've black boxed all this data and they don't allow anyone to look at it. Today, 
Heather's reaching for redemption. I started switching sides when COVID hit. She says talking with doctors and going to credible resources for information helped change her stance on vaccines. So it's kind of a humbling experience to realize that conspiracy theories aren't really real because you're not that special. She's now using social media to encourage others to be open to change like her. This is video Heather sent us of her receiving the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 yeah. vaccine. That was a long shot. These days, social media may feel like a war zone, but Heather says when it comes to convincing people to change their minds, the most effective way could be a more peaceful approach. Me being the worst anti-vaxxer that I'm uh, one of the worst I've ever seen. I'm just so boldly stupid. <laughs> and being able to change is just like a testimony of how you shouldn't give up on people. I truly think conversation is how to change the kind of wall we've hit with anti-vaxxers. I'm Chris Stewart reporting. Up next, we're going to recap today's top stories for you. So don't go away. Or if you go away, just come back. We've come too far together. Welcome back, folks. Before we cross the finish line, let's go ahead and close the loop on today's top stories. Over half a million people went missing in the U.S. last year alone, according to FBI data. But oftentimes, those going missing are people of color whose disappearances just don't get as much attention. In many states, a disproportionate number of those missing or killed are indigenous people. The Justice Department says that Native American women are murdered at a rate that's more than 10 times the national average. In Oklahoma, Democratic Representative Mickey Dollins offered bipartisan legislation known as Ida's Law, which directs the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to work with the federal government, tribal governments, and local law enforcement to get funding for its own unit addressing missing and murdered indigenous persons. Oklahoma is home to 39 federally recognized tribal nations. It also reportedly has one of the highest rates of missing or murdered indigenous women, though full data can be hard to come by. When I did some reporting a couple of years ago, uh, I met a, a woman who started this group called Sovereign Bodies Institute. And one of the things that they were really committed to was data collection. And the, uh, the leader of that group said that, you know, we can't solve a problem we can't, we don't track. Then with the help of our national correspondent, we got a sobering look at what rising sea levels could mean for places across the world. If you unplug your freezer, you know that the ice inside is going to melt but it's going to take some time. In some places, scientists had to work with artists to Photoshop sea level rise onto pictures. Working with our maps, we put the water exactly where the scientific projection says it belongs. Managing to meet global climate goals will still have devastating effects on coastal cities. 1.5, frankly, is already a lot, but it's probably the best that we could conceivably do at this point, since we're already you know, around 1.1. This is a San Diego beach resort today and projected sea level rise if the planet warms 1.5 degrees. There's a lot of sea level rise already in the pipeline. If we stopped polluting tomorrow, uh, we would see between five and 10 feet of sea level rise probably. As world leaders prepare for the UN climate conference, he asked which legacy they wanna leave. The future will remember them only for their failure to control climate change, unless they can. That's it for In The Loop. We're back every night with new episodes at 9 p.m. Eastern. Since you already made it through one Newsy show, keep it going. Stick here for more from Newsy.